And good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. My uh, greatest gratitude to everyone for being with us today. We're really excited for what is going to be a fun fireside. Uh, we're at module six, which is about staking and scaling principled games. And it starts to get into a forward look into what we think this next decade might look like. Um, we have some wonderful guests and it's my favorite when the guests are people and participants from the current kernel block. Um, in this case, Jasmine Wang and Donna Shabir have uh, graciously joined us and we'll get to their intros soon. Um, many of you may already know them, but we get to skip this slide. You all know how great you are. And we get to go straight into kind of like where we are in kernel. And then uh, Andy will go through some on module six's materials. So we are in week six of kernel, which is technically the seventh week, given we started with module zero. And this means that we're about a week from the uh, finale of this particular kernel block, which uh, at this time, I, I always like to remind people we always see as kind of the eight weeks of kernel is hopefully an introduction to the, the ways that we uh, hope to explore Web3 in this corner of, of, of the web over the next decade and a place that you always uh, can return to uh, in, in any shape or form or capacity that that is meaningful to you. And so, you know, it's uh, in many ways, it can be kind of like an emotional end period for me and, and perhaps for others, uh, but we're really excited to end well. And so the last module is in many ways, my favorite module, it's called The Gift. It's referenced um, in, in a few different places, but we'll, we'll save that for next week. We have a couple of other parts of the last week that are, are meaningful after Fireside will do kind of like a finale, which will be hopefully at least 30 minutes, if not more, like an hour in Gather Town, where we'll set up the Gather Town for, um, for kind of like a last hurrah and, uh, and some see you laters. And then we will have the Kernel Showcase, which is the day after. Uh, many of you maybe have already received message to, messages about Showcase if you've had adventures that are um, at a stage where it seems like showcase would be relevant. If you haven't received the message, but seem seems like it might be something you'd be keen to do, which would be like a two to three minute presentation of what it is that you've been working on or exploring in Web3, uh, followed by some time with people who might be interested in exploring with you further. There's all, all sorts of kernel mentors, but we're hoping other people from the ecosystem. Um, so that's showcase. Um, that'll be Friday after the Thursday call. And we're back towards kind of like uh, the sharing progress stages of kernel um, and uh, perhaps exploring in the sense of exploring what is still possible uh, with Web3 that we perhaps have not uh, uncovered yet uh, once we have a scalable uh, global machine upon which increasingly principal games can be played. And I will pass the mic to Andy to spend a bit more time exploring uh, where we are in the syllabus and the, the parts of this week. Thank you very much. We're at censorship resistance and learning, meandering our way toward the end of these two lists. And I thought that it would be uh, a nice way to introduce this conversation to tie up some of the different threads around censorship, penalties, engineering, and alternative economic ways of looking at money and speech by just speaking very briefly about this really rather technical aspect of the syllabus uh, so that we can get into the human motivation and the why, which is such a big driver for us and has been such a big part of kernel block four which has been incredible just to watch unfold but it seems right that censorship resistance is a sort of inherently ideological concern um, 
but when we fuse money and speech like we spoke about all the way back in module two and notice that there is in actual fact no such thing as free speech on chain there's only consensus about the costs for different kinds of meaningful speech acts where meaning is defined as a state changing transaction then we realize that the, in this particular kind of media and in this particular kind of context censorship resistance is not really a question of ideology it's one of engineering and if you read a lot of Vitalik's posts and a lot of the early cypherpunk stuff and a lot of what was going on in the mailing lists circa 2008 2009 you will see that a lot of that particular thread of thought has to do with creating threat and cost models not with ideological posturing about whether we should be able to censor something or not the entire point of the design rationale that is laid out in this week's module but also the wider thoughts about money and speech value trust this thing about encoding the different ways in which it is possible to cheat in order to develop trustless protocols you will see that all of this boils down to a very very different way of thinking about how we cultivate and grow pro-social goods between us, how we hatch commons, how we think about incentivizing increasingly more principled games to be played with increasingly more infinite players. Uh, and the reason that this engineering first approach to censorship resistance, it's not to say that ideology isn't important, it's just to say that it's not primary. And the reason you know, that there are two elegant reasons, uh, there are two reasons why that is elegant. The first is that we can be much more precise about what potential censors stand to gain and about how much it will cost them to gain it. All of the work in ETH2 is about precisely those two questions. And you can use incredibly succinct and elegant symbolic manipulation in the mathematical sense to develop very, very clear models of both the threats posed by potential sensors and the cost that it will, that they will have to bear in order to perform, perform certain kinds of actions in the network. I think that's fascinating. But secondly, and this for me is the much deeper point, it means that we know that we need no longer copy the ideological modes of censorship into our internal experience of the world. And what I mean by that is when censorship resistance and censorship in general is an ideological concern primarily, then the way in which we enshrine some supposed good as a constitutional right and then implement error handling for things like hate speech and defamation that particular structure of approaching the world and perceiving things gets mirrored in our internal state. And so this is why you'll see like censorship resisting and uncensored and learning next to each other in the sidebar of this week's module. It's because yes, there are these inherently political and deeply unjust, inequitable contexts in which uh, censorship takes place of various different kinds that we have to not only be aware of but actively speak against both with natural language and with executable code but more importantly you have to recognize deeply that the greatest censorship happens within and it happens within not only because you have this voice on your shoulder saying i'm not good enough to learn this i don't have the skills necessary i had a really mean maths teacher in third grade who told me that I was no good at understanding numbers and I've never been able to look at another one since without feeling a deep sense of anxiety. You know, that particular voice senses you deeply. And the reason it does that is because all of these concerns about censorship resistance are primarily ideological. So there's something inherently moral when we speak about these kinds of things. And we ran into the same problem with David Grieber and debt in module two, right? That like, as soon as you begin speaking about money and especially about debt, it has this tint of morality associated with it, which is very, very difficult to define and pin down so that you can actually have a coherent conversation about these kinds of topics. And 
I'm really excited about this shift that we see in the ETH2 design rationale towards engineering and away from ideology, precisely because it allows us not just to have more precise and coherent threat and cost models to share between each other, but also because all of a sudden the particular moral weight that these internal voices have of, oh, I'm not good enough, oh, I don't understand enough, oh, I'm not the right person for this. Those just carry less weight, that's all. And so I strongly recommend that you read the design rationale. I think it's a wonderful piece. And I've tried my best to simplify it so that if you just read the brief in the kernel syllabus, you should get a really great overview of what is going on with Ethereum 2. Very, very simply, the high level principles outlined by the foundation, Vitalik and various other researchers who've been working on this for years are simplicity, stability, sufficiency, defense in depth and full light client verification. These five things allow for any number of interesting engineering trade-offs that we can begin to look at together in order to decide what kind of pro-social world we want to pull into being together. And yeah, I think that's it's kind of interesting uh, that in this particular scheme, you'll see that just as protocols which define and encode what it means to cheat do not need to be trusted, protocols which define and encode penalties are more likely to benefit all their users. It's an unintuitive thing to say, but it is an incredibly potent part of that design rationale. This penalties first approach, which is a big part of the defense in depth and the simplicity associated with ETH2 means that the network itself is more likely to benefit all of the people that use it, which is not the case in proof of work. If you want to understand that more deeply, we can have a yunto about it and we can go more deeply into the design rationale. But critically, it is the trade-off between these different penalties which informs how we structure rewards. And so like, you see that I'm not against reward-based thinking and I'm not against ideological understandings of censorship resistance. It's just a question of which has primary importance as we navigate these really new economic worlds. Uh, the most fascinating part of ETH2 and the design rationale for me that comes out of these five principles and this really interesting interplay between encoding penalties, benefiting the most users, using the different penalties and the trade-offs implied by them to inform how rewards are structured means that what is actually happening in ETH2 when you're especially running a validator there is this collective reward scheme. There's a base fee, which is multiplied by P, the portion of validators who agree on any given state. So you're incentivized to agree to reach consensus with the people who are helping run the network. But because of the trade-off between different penalties, there is also simultaneously an incentive towards individual responsibility because if you join something like what we see of the current mining pools in Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these proof of work based systems, and that mining pool or validator pool in the case of E2 suffers some kind of failure, either the hardware goes down or something goes wrong with the client software that they're running and they submit a wrong attestation, then everybody's stake gets slashed. So there is this collective rewards going on as a result of the base fee B being multiplied by the portion of validators that agree. But simultaneous with that is this deep incentive towards individual responsibility. It is much, much better from a game theoretic perspective, not from a moral perspective, to run your own validator. Because if you are a part of a pool and something goes wrong with that pool, then everybody gets slashed on that pool, uh, which is... A really fascinating feature of this kind of design and hopefully one which can illustrate the practical pro-social benefits to thinking about censorship resistance, thinking about design, thinking about defense, the language of defense uh, in these engineering first ways, which then also sets us free internally to examine the different voices within ourselves 
and how they censor our own perceptions of the world in a way which is not moralistic, but is simply about observation and a neutral engagement with the different aspects and facets of our own perception. I'll leave it to Vivek to introduce uh, our two wonderful guests. And I'm so excited because this week I get to go back to my general role of asking difficult questions and then being endlessly entertained by other people. <laughs> the moment, moment of truth there for Jasmine and Danish. You guys are the entertainers apparently. But I, I do have lots to say before we, we kick off. There's um, there's lots that I could say about the backgrounds of Jasmine and Danish, but I'll leave most of it to uh, to you all if you want to see them. They've left wonderful bios in Colonel Slack, and um, you know both of them completely blew us away in our first contact with them, which was mostly through the Colonel applications they put forth, which shared a, an incredible depth of technical expertise for both of them. Um, both have very, very strong technical backgrounds. But um, for me personally, my first contact with both of them was through their writing. Um, Jasmine wrote a piece uh, that was called Value Beyond Instrumentalization, which is a word that I have now had to say out loud at least 15 times. And I'm still trying to figure out how to put in words. But the concept is one that I remember in the early days of kernel block four or even before block four started we as stewards looked at that word instrumentalization and that piece in depth to understand a mode by which kernel may find uh, more enriching ground to to travel and there was a lot from that piece that that inspired us donish on perhaps a more personal note uh, has has done some really incredible fiction writing and uh, my background I'm half Kashmiri on my mom's side, which is the northern tip of India. Uh, and Danish shares that uh, that background and has done some writing uh, about Kashmir. And there's a long kind of like rich history, not all pretty, but some really beautiful parts of Kashmir that that resonate just by the lived experience of um, being put back in that beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Donish's writing, uh, I, was, I was grateful to be touched in that regard. And they've only continued uh, as they've gone on in Colonel Block 4. Uh, this last week uh, through the Versus Twitter account, uh, they released a declaration of the interdependence of cyberspace alongside incredible collaborators beyond them too, which I'm sure they want me to say, but they uh, defined this space called the pluriverse, which I think in many ways is a space that Andy has just spent the last five or 10 minutes describing, a, a space that is possible given the censorship resistance of Web3 protocols and um, a space that is both individually accountable, um, but also uh, collectively beneficial. And um, I, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Um, there's a quite wonderful part of the declaration that's on this, on this page right here. You can read the whole thing on the Versus website, uh, which I hope somebody can put into chat. It's not there yet. We're really, really grateful to welcome Jasmine and Danish today. Yeah, it's one of our favorite things to have Colonel Fellows join us in the fireside. Uh, so it's lovely also to have external guests, but uh, this has a particularly special flavor. Uh, just like mom's cooking, I think is basically how I imagine it. Um, and one of the places that I would like to start, it's difficult to uh, know exactly where, but you know, all of the stuff that I've said about censorship resistance and ETH2 is, is wonderful. Um, but what of the human motivation for building systems like this? You know, we can understand the technical principles, we can understand how thinking in engineering terms helps us both in terms of how we share with others and in terms of our internal landscape. But 
it's still this big question why why do we do this stuff what is it about building a better web that feels so consequential and in the syllabus to try and understand some of this we turn to brett victor and a wonderful video of his called inventing on principle in which he says that bringing ideas into the world is one of the most important things that people do and great ideas, art, stories, inventions, and scientific theories take on lives of their own, which give meaning to our lives as people. On the slide here, we have a wonderful idea, which is already taking on a life of its own beyond the lives of those just on this call. And so I wonder from both of your perspectives and starting with Jasmine, would you tell us a little bit of a little bit about the act of birthing this Declaration of Independence and what sorts of meaning you hope to see it shape beyond your own life. Thank you, Andy. Um, one thing I would actually love to invite the audience to do as well, and this is chaotic, I did not <laughs> discuss this with Vic and Andy before, but for folks who participated in the creation of this document, if folks want to add any thoughts in the Zoom about like your own story about how this came about, please, I, I would like love to see them. Um, how I would tell the story of this document up until the release two days ago, no, three days ago, <laughs> time. And hopefully from that point onwards as well is a story of expanding possibilities as more and more people became excited and invigorated um, and oriented towards some like common object together. Um, I, in particular, want to acknowledge like a few folks who sunk a lot of hours into the project. So Safran Huang, Jason Sun, Sid Code, Paul Gaddy, Ai Tuanin, um, Song Yi Li, and I'm sure I'm missing people. Um, there were too many people to name. Um, so this was entirely like a grassroots, um, chaotic, Google Doc, um, <laughs> so much energy bubbling. We, we, you see this like precise, beautiful, like coherent document. <laughs> and before then, <laughs> right until like the last moment, it was like chaos, <laughs> good chaos. Um, it just read the Facebook rebranding itself as meta um, document. And we were listening to um, a few friends and um, I would name Gareth, here um, and I were listening to interdependence.fm by Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst and decided to send out a little flare into the world. That was just like a play on words, like we should have a declaration of this type of the interdependence of cyberspace. And then as soon as we spoke that, we realized that it was, we were like, wait, <laughs> that makes sense. That, that resonates on some level that we like cannot articulate yet and we just, thought this is an idea to play with um, and to grow. And as we um, continue to play with it, the more levels of meaning um, were attached to like the statement. Um, so we started writing, we, we took John Perry Barlow's text, pasted it on Google Doc um, and started inviting people in. And people gathered on the Google Doc, saw the energy of all the anonymous animal icons, <laughs> created a Telegram chat. And it just felt like as the energy, as um, energy continued to come and possibilities continue to expand, that we, what we're, or I'll speak for myself, what I was trying to do is just like create appropriate spaces for that energy to come through. Because so many people um, are just like deeply excited about this work. Um, and maybe I'll hand it off to Donish here, um, because one significant part of the story expanding or the scope or like the range of possibilities for this document was when it moved beyond a pure textual artifact. When Donish came and was like, we, we can do something here um, where the software can reflect the ethos of the text and we can weave software in a way that highlights the ethos. Um, maybe the last thing I'll say was actually a quote from Andy that um, Andy just shared um, from Little Prince. Like, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men and women to gather wood, <laughs> divide the work, and give orders. Um, instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. And this quote just resonates on so many levels with this work. 
this felt like what happened with the document itself, but is also what the document aims for as an act um, to try and like, paint the sky that we might grasp for together. Um, hand it off to Danish. <laughs> It's it's so it's such a pleasure to listen to Jasmine and um, I had been listening to Jasmine um, in months and weeks leading up to this weekend um, and I think we'd been yearning for a collaboration of some sort um, and when this declaration appeared um, I remember it took up several nights of like you'd feel strongly about a word and you'd leave comments and then the next morning someone make a stronger argument and then it would be changed um and i think all that energy like i'd say like 20 people on the dock um sometime to think sometime over the weekend this was going to be posted um somewhere didn't feel correct or didn't kind of miss the ethos and i just personally am very like i, I think we both like to like create our gardens and one thing in retrospect it's easy to draw a thread but in the moment it was very asynchronous like we didn't communicate and align on this vision but to our actions i think we increased the contour of ambition so like jasmine would increasingly ping like very senior people and instead of arguing that this should be this should have its own space i just spun up an app and um, when some of our devs friends saw that uh, they helped collapse our month-long roadmap into like a few days. So very grateful to Raymond Zong and Jackie um, Shell for doing that. Um, it kind of felt like the stone soup, like in the against the Facebook announcement, we started like a simple stone soup, and as the soup got tastier and tastier, the vi the village got bigger, and the party the party was much more vibrant. And something about that is also like building an open hacker collective and the way Ethereum is built. Um, so it's life-changing for me to work in this way. It's, uh, it's just my sense of time and like what is possible has just completely transformed. They used to do like, like I, you know, I am, this is a weekend build or I only have so much time. But yes, yeah, squad weld, squad weld is, I'll let Jasmine tie this up. Yeah, maybe a final note that is not a direct response to Andy's question is that th this this document was birthed and like immediately precipitated by a certain event. But these are ideas that I think that have very much been in the community for a really long time. <laughs> um, and also moving forward, like if I think about, I wish I could draw, I wish I could just draw a graphic with my hands. That would be cool. <laughs> in a hundred years time, like there's this like lineage before the document and then this like little snip where we came in and like articulated something and like, like some piece of it. But we had to choose when to cut off, when that, oh, um, when the document was frozen. Like it is, it is very, very difficult um, potentially impossible with such a value-laden document where it's so full of metaphor, where all the words and the structures of the sentences have so many overtones of different layered meanings to come to a consensus about what the final artifact should be. We had to freeze it at some point. And even after we said, this is frozen, like many people um, had various comments. And this this is this feels like really important <laughs> to note, and I, I've, I'm still like meditating on why. But like one, we we chose to froze it because we want to have a timely response to this immediate, like precipitating action of Facebook branding itself as Meta. Um, but also in acknowledgement of this other fact that is very hard to come to a consensus document. I think it is actually really appropriate for Web three and also for the world moving forward that it's not about having a ontologically coherent single document response in response to Facebook's like top down single document declaration of like what meta is and their vision of what meta is, um, the metaverse. Um, but rather having this as a starting point from which people can fork, <laughs> can write, and hopefully that, that we can also help resource um, both in terms of like 
writing support as well as like capital to create like the space and time um, because we were also very lucky to have the space and time <laughs> to do this um, and create an ecology of text but we can go into that later I just want to acknowledge that this time pressure in some sense was like um, because of this like most recent act but in many ways we want this document to be timeless and evolving and we think that's appropriate like for the type of work that needs to be done here amazing yeah there's no such thing as labor so we'll go into it right now because now is both timeless and constantly changing just like the documents these two things that both of you have said really touch me so deeply the notion of the expanse of possibilities uh, and the contours of ambition right Danish knows very well and something that I adore about him and about the little time that I've had to speak with him, which will hopefully extend into timelessness, <laughs> as uh, uh, many blocks unfold from here, that, of course, we thread our own narrative looking back and yet in the moment these things happen asynchronously. And if we can take those two notions, the contours of ambition, and the expanse of possibilities and apply them to the ability to fork this document endlessly. I wonder how you think about meaning again in that context, right? Because it's not then just hold, held in the actual content, i.e. what the document says, but there's something really deep about the way in which we are brought to different kinds of knowledge uh, by virtue of the fact that it's not one voice that here we're inviting anyone to the pluriverse and the very status of that invitation is infinitely rewritable and yet permanent, timeless and yet evolving. That's, <laughs> it's so cool. I'm just stirring that into the stone soup. Please don't do you want. That's a, that's a great herb, a rare herb thrown into our stone soup. Um, it, this, this connects with, um, sort of the theme of today, which is like engineering um, responses um, or engineering the space for, to be able to speak truth to power. Um, and I think of the fork as also like, the fork introduces a cognitive cost is you have to respond to this text um, and you have to claim your place as part of the lineage of responses. Um, and it also introduces a gas cost, which um, because we are exercising editorial control, we're covering that, but you can imagine in the future. Um, and then the, the act of signature and creating sort of a coupling with Twitter to um, first to create that halo of sanctity that your signature will be yours. Um, and also the, the like letting people follow these desire paths of like I'm reading this thing and it's like you read it but it's also we let you create a Twitter bookmark about it um, is one thing. This is a side note. It's really frustrating. Thing, is like reading and writing is so central to my life and the life of my friends and so many people in the world. We don't really have spaces um, to accommodate that. Like Goodreads is the second best and it's really quite terrible. Um, so to just like leave these tracts of our time that is spent between texts and within texts, like all over our feeds um, is, is something that uh, is kind of interesting. Um, but back to the, yeah, the, how do you engineer a, a space for um, disagreement and also a be yeah, a better quality of discourse where, where like disagreement is valued and maintained. So the hypothesis, it'd be interesting to see as this opens up, like whether the cognitive and gas cost and the structure um, results in, in, in something um, fun and interesting, inspiring. When I saw this question, I, um, <laughs> I didn't have enough time to go down this rabbit hole, but I was like, what is knowledge? <laughs> um, but uh, on the first level pass, like if I look at a piece of writing, like there's just so much work that's erased in like presenting it as this like 
coherent monolithic thing um and even if it's if we accept that like who is at the table like where did the language come from how were trade-offs made between different terms what was the thinking and creation process behind this document um who, who are the authors like in this case this is an authorless document who aligns with this document who who can i like talk to about this um in like a good faith way um we, i think our first this this declaration is one answer to trying to answer these questions that people have had time in like encountering documents um maybe the second thing i touch on is knowledge of others wants <laughs> um like i think this is a deeply like um <laughs> wants and needs laden document <laughs> it's a statement about people's like dreams um and i think our own dreams and wants like seem natural um and knowledge of other people's wants is something i've been thinking a lot about and how we can like empathize with those things and coalition build around different wants and needs um even so coalition building in the sense of I might not share your dreams but i understand why they might exist and what lineage is you're part of what shared like generational dreams perhaps um that you participate in it would be fascinating to explore some practical lessons about how you build those coalitions and in particular through the lens of something that Danish has said I think which really every time I speak with you it just touches me so much uh, that there is both this need to create space in our environments and whether that's textual or lived is to kind of merge in very interesting ways for people who are as deeply interested in text as well and not just create space but have space for different kinds of embodied experience so jasmine i'm fascinated when you speak about the energy in this document so it's when you think about it you know like because i'm very sensitive to words as well like, what, what do we really mean? Because everybody knows, yes, there's this huge energy around the Slack channel. There's this huge energy around the, uh, a document that we, we, we can feel it, we can intuit it. And yet our embodied experience of that energy is quite different. And I wonder how our embodied experience of energy can be put in conversation with coalition building and understanding the wants of others so that you can come up with these kinds of wonderfully forkable infinite documents that nevertheless still kind of appear coherent <laughs> and which do hold the dreams of more than one person which is an incredible feat in and of itself this is a non sequitur um like set of sentences but i want to just read out the first sentence that's included on this slide again the plur versus the cyber physical commons arrayed over the web of our social relationships, a space that does not transcend materiality, but is entangled with it. And after reading out that first sentence, I want to say, like, in we did not do a very good job of coalition building <laughs> with this first drop. We did not have, I, and I hinted at this a bit in saying that we had to freeze the document. Um, but there, we, we worked in a very speedy, hackery way, <laughs> and that attracts a sort of energy that we love and we can work with and we know how to engage with. Um, but this also excludes like certain groups that maybe want to engage on a certain ca different cadence or like in person um, or just uh, with different variables <laughs> um, that w we had a particular um, parameterization, parameterization of like in this round of the document. Um, so in thinking about creating spaces for thought, I, I, th I, my, my current answer to this and hope um, is that there will be both, there will be variants of spaces, like not just digital. Um, I'll maybe discuss a little bit of like putting together um, the artifact that is Kernel Magazine. That actually started with having um, a retreat <laughs> in the woods for a month where we like lived together in a cooperative um, and our 
work was almost necessarily ecology that emerged out of that. Like we affected each other's thinking, affect each other's pieces, we edit each other's work. Um, and there are a lot of interactions that are, I think are still really, really hard to capture um, digitally and trust that is like still hard to capture. Um, so in terms of creating space, I'm, that's something I've been thinking about. It's like, is there, what are the things that we can only get in person? And um, at least for now, like in terms of moving forward with versus, one of the things we're thinking about is having physical gathering <laughs> and then an artifact that comes out of that um, as um, in sort of this like punctuated publication pattern. And precisely because there was so much um, energy, time, um, and tracks on the Google Doc, and we had to freeze it because of the um, Facebook. Um, it felt wrong. The, the, the act of freezing created the space and desire and energy to, to put all this technical and organizational work um, into creating this field where that that conversation can continue to happen because Google Docs is not the right uh, format. So, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I have the same sense that I had with Miran. It's like, how can I ask the next question with the fewest possible words just to have the two of you delightful people carry on speaking? And it seems to me that in this idea of coalition building of uh, the recognition that it's really difficult and that there are many different ways of doing it and that perhaps the ways in which you approach to leave room for improvement, which is a wonderful thing to be celebrated. When Brett Victor speaks, he says, you know, to me, it feels like a moral wrong. It feels like an injustice. And I feel it is my responsibility to do something when I see a creator without immediate access to that which they're creating. And there's something really interesting in this notion of not like opportunity or business case, but responsibility. And there's something really interesting about the way responsibility links with need and with other people's wants. So I wonder, what are the things that you feel most responsible for? You can answer that in the context of this document or wider life and how that links you with others and their wants, their desires. Tanish, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, you, you go first. You. Hmm. I, I have been rereading bell hooks like all about love recently and i love the definition of love um the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth and i have an amendment more chaos <laughs> to that um and perhaps like the extension of that person's spirit into the world in a way that is um amenable to them that they're they're excited about um and retroactively, when I look at like my body of work or like practices or like happenings, um, this feels like the common thread. Um, I I taught theater for a long time and speech and debate and seeing. I, I call this phenomenon of like being like frozen and locked within oneself, like the stone tongue, <laughs> like unable to like speak or like voice to dream to externalize like things such that other people might interact with them. Um, and that was like my first sense of like, whoa, like I, I feel like this is a moral wrong for someone to be like stuck in that mode. Um, I see this work in editing and helping clarify, um, helping people articulate what they're seeing, what they're trying to talk about, like helping people grasp at words. Um, there's also actual like programmatic things you can do here. Which I think is like a unique like value of like software and like blockchain um, because it is really socially expensive and time expensive actually financially expensive 
and requires space and time and energy to do this sort of reflection. Um, another great book is like um, How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. She talks a lot about this, the creation of space and for to reflect so, like moral attention as a prerequisite to um, moral action. Um, and she also notes, and I agree with this, that this is like a huge privilege. And if there are ways to make this easier, like this act of like being able to express yourself in a thoughtful way, that feels like the natural, like logical application of like this tool set that I've built to this responsibility that I feel of like people being able to like articulate their light and their dreams. And, and not, not in just um, sort of like a positive, like this is not only a positive thing, like you must also expose your dreams because they're not immune to critique. Like we need to talk about stuff, <laughs> right? <laughs> like well, dreams are not immune to critique just simply because they're dreams. Um, okay. But bringing things in conversation with each other. Danish. In, in conversation with Jasmine's work is very um, embodied and, and in background in theater. My background um, before software was in architecture and um, economics and thinking it's kind of like what happens when um, my body is not there or what are the forces on my body that are beyond our bodies that are sort of this um, super body. And like sometimes, yes, the stuckness can be located within the body, but um, thinking a lot about how the paved paths of you know web two software and social relations, as well as the current um, economic structure, um, sort of collapses our dreams and um, restricts what we we think is possible. So I feel really responsible along with um, this entire squad and others, I think in Web3 to like give people, um, I don't know, give people, it's like there should be more, it should be easier to just follow your desired path. And I think merely um, Web tools are not enough, which is why I'm really excited about crypto economic building blocks that can actually be a counterpoint to the economic structure, because we say in the declaration that the, we want the freedom to choose any and all relations, but something I really struggle with is that the current economic structure really favors some and incentivizes some relationships of violence and exploitation. Um, and even if there are tools to choose any relations, those, those relations can be chosen unless we also have um, economic counterpoints. That is something I, I do feel responsibility for. That's really just, as I say, sensational and a privilege to hear both of you speak about this. And I wonder, Jasmine, seeing as you brought up then some of the sort of exuberant quotes about longing and yearning, you know, one of the other things that Brett Victor speaks about is that this way of being is principled living in the world it's not an imposition, it's just a possibility. And, and there is something about it which is important and necessary and right. And given what both of you have said, I think that we can sort of put away the terms important and right as being somewhat dogmatic and somewhat too closely aligned with the paved paths of Web 2 and previous versions of our sociality. We specify perhaps too dogmatically the ways in which it's possible to interact. But I wonder if you can articulate uh, the, the kind of need that I drove to this work, but more deeply, which drives you. Like, like what, what do you yearn to see in the world? Uh, not just what are we responsible for, but what is, the, what is the deep dream with this tool set that is now more and more accessible? I think. Yeah, another secret is that I think we just wanted space and time for our own writing. And that's been, um, that's created the conditions for some of some of our projects like this. Um, and I don't know, and behind the need for that writing, I think for me is 
especially a desire to be in tradition, to, to be in a lineage. Um, and I, like there's also thinking about the authorlessness of, of this work it is interesting because there's a lot of, there used to be a lot of debate in Islamic art about um, what is the role of personal style? Because for a long time, it was considered rude to sign your work um, because your work really exists in a workshop, especially in miniature painting, um, but also in the temporal workshop of your ancestors. You really just like the first task is really to just reach that pattern that someone left behind. Um, so there, there is there is sort of verticality to this um, because our capacities are limited, and there is a verticality to craft. So I think in that tradition, like sometimes too much emphasis on individual style can be a distraction from reaching um, ways of seeing the truth. Um, that were really valuable. But of course, that world is now gone and long gone. And um, there is some value in um, personal perspective that Western art um, brought into the conversation. But what I think a lot about, especially with literature, is like having um, it's like this continuous conversation with you know people who are long gone. Um, and I don't know why I need to have it, but I feel very good. I feel less alone, uh, like with some, you know, Dante is like, when did he live? And what was such a different world? But it feels, it feels like yesterday and it feels um, beyond the noise of the present and the future and everything that's always changing. There is this thread um, that has been woven. Um, so the need, I, don't know how to directly answer this question, but the need is about all of these things. I have been also, <laughs> I, I've been trying to shape a poem out of this, but there is no poem yet. It's more in conversation with people, like this like thought or collection of sentences. So a semi-poem, um, like there are those who dance and we delight in them, we watch their joy, we wish to protect their light. There are those who protect, who feel this need to, like, if, if I see this, like, people are like, dancing around this fire, like, they're, they're, they're the human border between them and the shadows. Um, but you can also protect by dancing. And that's something I've been thinking about. Um, so I guess, like, in my <laughs> to make that more concrete, I've been thinking about um, more a need to feel versus like a need towards a particular act. There's like, there are two main like um, ethical like lineages and one one of them focuses on like action. <laughs> um, and the other lineage, which I think I've like hinted at a little bit with Jenny O'Dell is um, the moral impetus on the actor is like to notice, like to witness and to see. Um, and I guess in my work, or at least presently in my life, I'm think, I've been thinking about how pain like focuses and clarifies attention. Like Facebook's rebranding as meta was so deeply painful. It was a cut. It was like, this is like so against like everything that like, when I say we, I mean like this community, but just we <laughs> want. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking about that um, and thinking about people dancing, like people moving with joy, meaning, um, thoughtfulness and wisdom and moving with the con being able and having the space and time to be able to move with the consciousness of being a good ancestor and being and generating lineage one of the tweets <laughs> that came out with the announcement of the document was um, we must all decide to build with the principle of interdependence we must all choose to be wise to be graceful to be thoughtful and we must act in a way that we are proud to have recorded in an immutable permanent history. Um, so I guess this this is not a um, direct answer to your question again, Andy, but in terms of answering the question of like, what do we need to do, I've been thinking more about the question about how to be, like what do I need to be and how do I need to act in this 
um, some version of like Nietzsche's eternal recurrence where I have a sense that like the way that I act is like is what is the thing that extends either like horizontally through pure group um, because we are all like mirrored chameleons <laughs> looking at each other um, or j even just as a reminder to my future self like this is an act enclosed in such a way practiced in such a way um, that inspires my future self to be a certain way. And, and there's something that Jasmine has said um, before in our conversation is that like Meta was able to be co-opted because um, there was no clear articulation of what it was. Um, and as Vivek also said in the chat, there are also paved paths of Web3 that sometimes don't feel quite right um, or not quite the dreams we were dreaming. So it feels like we need to um, create some coherence and um, a le very legible coherence. So then people cannot take a word because it's very clear what that word means and what they're doing is not the meaning of that word. It's incredible. There is... C could I say one quick thing about the Met just because this seems like an appropriate place to say it about this um, decision of Facebook. It's an opportunity by, by doing what they're doing, by, you know, by sort of trying, co-opting this word and this idea. In some ways, they're admitting that they are not real in a way. In other words, this, I think that this act might in some ways sort of wake people up to the fact of what Facebook actually is and that it's, it's okay to let that play out because I think people have collectively speaking a misconception about what it is. It isn't reality. And by admitting that they are a metaverse, they have suddenly outed themselves as not reality. And in some ways that is an opportunity and a gift. Do you have some thoughts on that either? Or thoughts? Wonderful. Um, I think that that's something that we'll circle back to in just a moment. Um, one of the things which I wanted to touch on uh, in terms of this uh, dance of protection, of the fire of the middle and the shadows in the background. Uh, which are intimately linked with the fire. Uh, there's this beautiful passage always that comes to mind out of Toni Morrison's book, Beloved, which is about the middle crossing, about slavery and the journey across the Atlantic and all of the pain that this has left in our ancestral lineage. Uh, and here are two particularly moving passages from that book for me. The one reads, they stopped praying and took a step back to the beginning. In the beginning, there were no words. In the beginning was the sound and they all knew what that sound sounded like. It started that way, laughing children, dancing men, crying women. And then it got mixed up. Women stopped crying and danced. Men sat down and cried. Children danced, women laughed, children cried until baby sobs holy, offered up to them her own great heart. And so for me, it links to Duende, to the struggle, to the difficulty of moving constantly between these two worlds, whether we call them you know, reality the metaverse, whatever name we give to the constant shifting between emptiness and form, recognizing that the world is intimately and totally interdependent at all levels, as Rich says, all is relationship. And then recognizing that we still have some accountability and responsibility as a 
person here and now in this particular timeless moment, in this particular embodied space, who has the choice, as Jasmine said, it just blows my mind to choose wisdom, to choose grace, to choose courtesy. Uh, this to me points at this notion of the infinite heart, right? uh, that there is when we enter that particular customary space between, that's when the spirit of revelation is dragged up into the room and the duende has been wrested from his den. Uh, so I wonder, you know, Jasmine, this it's it's me circling around this notion of eternal recurrence and uh, <laughs> the ancestral lineage and this notion of heart. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on the ways in which this particular work, as you say, which has evolved out of so much else, has opened the heart. Uh, do you have an experience of that? I feel like I don't have a coherent answer to this. It feels like it's like a tacit thing that I can't like quite articulate. And I also want to apologize because I feel like during this entire space, I've been trying to like gesture at something. And one thing that I'll acknowledge is like this work was so vibrant and recent. Like thoughts are still like annealing and coalescing about what it meant. Like this work was so like perhaps of like all, I don't want to, Okay, I will just say this. I think perhaps of like all the work I've done, this feels like the most like heartfelt object, like practice story that I've been honored to be a part of. And I'm still trying to like be with that and see the means. I, I feel so, so honored that so many people brought um, their hearts to this work. Like just throughout the week, got so many texts um, from, I, I won't name people, some of the people are here, but saying like they were so moved by this that um, like they cried. And that, that means so much because one thing, one thing I've been thinking about, and this is from LM Sakasas, just to shout out another person to whom we owe a lot of spiritual debt, but he has this article, The Paradox of Control, where he talks about sociologist Hans Rosa um, one way of orienting towards the other is like viewing yourself as like a closed off system, aim to like model the other, understand how it works such that you might intervene <laughs> in that system. It's this like the urge sometimes that I map onto technologists perhaps unfairly as a, and I say this as a technologist myself, to understand in order to control um, to dominate in some sense, to like mediate, to direct. Um, and Rosa talks about another way of orienting towards the other that they call tempting to resonate with, which I, I've been thinking about that word. I, I don't know if I love it yet. <laughs> um, but the thing that she, they're trying to get at is if you leave yourself um, open to the possibility of transformation, um, that, that is a different way of orienting towards the other and requires vulnerability and risk. And I feel um, so honored and moved that others have allowed themselves to be moved by this work. Um, and actually here I'll also cite Escobar who um, used, um, from whom we drew the term pluriverse. He, um, says like the pluriverse and I'm, I'm abbreviating here because I don't have the quote in front of me um, but the pluriverse is not just about a multiplicity of worlds but asking of ourselves what sort of beings we hope to be um, and there, there's a there's a linkage between these two things that I don't <laughs> quite have the grasp on yet but these two thoughts <laughs> that I'll present incredible incredible what a 
Ganesh, I have a similar question for you based on uh, one of Jasmine's initial responses, which is, what, what is knowledge? <laughs> um, so, you know, in the Islamic sort of heritage and tradition, uh, of which you are deeply aware and intimately a part, uh, you will know that one of the names is Alalim, right, which is the all knowing. Uh, and linked with that, this notion that knowledge is the great connector, right? Uh, what binds all things together to know is to be intimately a part of. There is another name which comes to mind as al baki ongoing, right? But when we are connected and interdependent with all things, we know that it's not my life, there is only life, and life is no beginning and no end. Yes, these cycles of eternal recurrence, but one stream. Uh, and that brings us to one of my favorite names, given my own particular academic interests, but also my own life, is uh, Al Ahad, right? Ahadiyya, singularity. And it comes in probably my favorite chapter of the Quran, Surah Al Ikhlas, which has to do with sincerity. And so I wonder if you can speak a little bit about sincerity and knowledge and what these two things have to do with your own kind of singular experience. Do you, you know, it, it's wonderful, isn't it, that there's the singular document, which is infinitely iterable. There's this frozen version, which can be thawed by a thousand different people, should they be willing to pay the gas costs and heat it up. <laughs> Amazing. So I wonder, yeah, sincerity and knowledge, singularity, your own experience. This is the sort of the dream, dream conversation where you have <laughs> all these traditions um, coming together. Um, but I'll start with a more trite answer. And I've been thinking a lot about how um, the spaces we have for circulation of information like Twitter, there's a lot of know-how that's circulated and a lot of memes. Um, but in my life, at least, it doesn't engender understanding and maybe knowledge. Um, like I, I know a lot of things and a lot of things are on the ledge of Twitter that are made to be known. Um, but how does true understanding form? And that often takes time and the unconscious and the duende, like all of those things have to come together um, and you synthesize and weave the information you received um, with, with the life that is always ongoing and a process that's much bigger than you. Um, so I, I, yeah, I don't exactly know what knowledge is, but there's a lot of knowledge without understanding that I am afraid of. And I do like something that Andy works on um, and the, in the general sort of, there's a field of the mnemonic medium and sort of staying with, um, with pieces of information or knowledge um, for months until you, it be, they become part of your body and they become understanding. Um, and there must be sincerity there somewhere when, when it becomes part of your, your body and the body of the world. Um, what do you, uh, in your own experience, how has like knowledge led to understanding? Is there some aspect of like thirst or need? This beautiful notion from Gabriel Garcia Lorca in that post, right? That um, it's wonderful to know what glasses are for. Uh, it's, it's good to know that glasses are to drink from. The bad thing is not to know what thirst is for. And that's, that, to me, it speaks a little bit about, like, we can know what glasses are for. It's wonderful, you know, it's conceptual understanding of things. But to be in the raw reality of thirst and to birth from that through struggle and through darting into the darkness beyond the protective circle uh, is some understanding which uh, is not potentially meant to live in words. 
uh, which is wonderful, but can be uh, <laughs> in my, put into the stone suit. In the, Enjoy. I don't have a direct answer, but it's shortcuts. I don't think I have as much understanding. Um, and, and the thirst is for, for understanding. Um, but there, there is, um, or the shortcut that we take in, in the poetry of, especially of the Persian world is, you know, all the desire and yearning for the beloved is really for the capital B beloved, which is this inexplicable fact that we exist. And like, how do we, like, how is a universe sort of looking at itself and recognizing itself. And I think a shortcut I've taken in my life, and I'm not fully satisfied with this is like, I did, I try to trace all of yearning back to that question, of like what, what is this inexplicable universe in life? And will we, is there like a um, arrow or is there like a temporal arc? Like, will we, Will we understand more? Will we see more? It's part of the human game. I don't, I don't know um, what is there, but with, with all the things we keep inventing, it feels like we can see, we get more inform, a lot more information, um, but I don't know if it changes anything, but it's exciting. changes the way your eyes glint when you smile. That's uh, enough. Uh, <laughs> so amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Allahu Akbar. Greater, always greater than anything you can think, say, <laughs> imagine. Not great or greatest, not some delimiting sense, but this way of using language to indicate the moon without ever claiming that one knows fully what that is stay in that state forever of wonder. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's kind of something I've been thinking about recently also is, uh, you know, this tendency towards describing the extraordinary, you know, claiming this is your own. It's just amazing to me that anybody thinks any of this is ordinary. <laughs> So it's a kind of makes me laugh, uh, which is, I think what you're pointing at is just the miraculous nature of each moment. And when we're really there for all of it and all of the infinite threads that join together and lead away from each sort of incandescent jewel in space and time, it's wonderful. Um, so, this is not really a question, but I've been completely colonized by Jasmine's chaos and delighted. I never want to leave this. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I love the two of you. You're wonderful. The work that you've done is really incredible. It's just a great privilege to be able to share spaces like this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. And I just want to acknowledge our massive debt uh, slash slash like <laughs> recognition of the gi the gift of the commu kernel community like I speak for myself here but I don't think I wouldn't even have conceptualized that this sort of work the the sort of thing we're trying to do um, was possible like without this space so thank you like words are not enough I feel so so grateful thank you Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a nice bonfire going. That, that is kind of that really enabled our stones. Amazing, amazing. Now I really want some stone soup. Um, wonderful. Well, we do have some time, as always, for kind of questions and answers. The one person that I really do want to call out for this week is, is Sister Tibebwa, who has been greeting us for many weeks with a wonderful greeting that includes uh, both light and darkness in the greeting. And the duende that is on the screen today, I realize is 
uh, been a week where it's been a week where I've been able to reflect on her greeting and she shared some wonderful thoughts in the chat. Sister, would love if you were willing to share and perhaps we can continue the conversation for a bit. I would commentary. Go ahead. Greetings, Kona family. Greetings of love and light and peace and darkness. Um, one of my teachers teaches that we can only embrace our light in the same measure as we embrace our dark. And so the more that we strive only to live in the light, we miss a whole half of ourselves. And the teachings of the ancient Egyptians, the Kemetic people, they teach us that to become manifest, we leave our exact shape or our ka in the unmanifest and our deep yearning for reuniting with the beloved is actually the yearning for reuniting with, if you want to say, the part of ourselves that we've left behind in the unmanifest. And actually, if we really do reunite, we cease to be living, we cease to be physically manifest. It's the, if you want to say, the greatest alchemy when those that know how to transcend that's what they do. They are able to reunite with the part of themselves that was left behind and therefore cease to manifest or cease to be in this third dimensional world. Um, and so um, in all aspects, we have, as you, I, I remember in one of the firesides, we looked at individual. So even in the individual, you have the dual. And so we are all have the divine masculine, the divine feminine. We, we have all, we always have these two sides that even if you look at the yin and the yang, which, you know, represents the light and the dark or the masculine and the feminine, but right in the center of the dark is a little point of light. And right in the center of the light is a little point of dark. And so you'll see both in all things including like, you know, traditionally we may say, you know, father sky, like the heavenly father and the earthly mother. But yet when the ancient African traditions, you see the heavenly uh, mother, Nut, and the, um, the earthly father, which is uh, Geb, that's the father of the earth. And so in all things, we have this duality seeking for union um and so yeah that's that's why i greet in both because we must embrace both i loved the duende i loved the gypsy reference i stayed up until four o'clock last night studying it all and um yeah i'm i love the fact that we're willing to hold space for it all and we have a strong enough container to be able to hold space for it all instead of only looking for one side so celebrating um, all that I've learned, all that you're holding space for, um, Jasmine and Danish, I loved, um, you know, the honesty and the vulnerability and, um, and the ability to, um, to conceptualize things that are not even yet, you know, they're so new that they're not even yet even manifested. And, um, and so, yes, give thanks and praise. Thank you. Thank you, sister. I, I did want to say that next week is the full moon. And I have been meditating on what I could bring to such an esteemed company of offerings, because I've seen offerings after offerings, and I, I have nothing that I can offer in the web tree, but I do hold um, moon ceremonies. So I would be honored to hold a full moon ceremony for Colonel family. Um, and so I will post it up if anyone wants to join um, in, um, in connecting to the cycles of the moon. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, sister. It's a uh, divine timing, this kind of block ending. I'm really, really grateful for your contribution um, and excited for, for such a beautiful ceremony to end the block. Um, I, I think we can end it here today because I don't know that there's a better note to end it off on. 
Andy, anything you have? You I'm very happy. It's uh, very those beautiful words. Thank you so very, very, very much from my heart and to all of you. It's just uh, one overflows occasionally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, next week, the last module, the gift, um, and the showcase to end, and um, some other festivities, as have been referenced by Sister, which is wonderful. Um, I'll put the link to the Gather Town in the chat uh, for anyone who does want to kind of decompress, hang out after. Um, but uh, if not, have a wonderful rest of your day, have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you for week seven very, very soon. Thank you all. Um, Jasmine Donish, don't feel like you have to join in the cafe. Uh, we just pop in there to see if anyone pops over. But thank you. Thank you so much. It was so fun. I'm gonna hop over <laughs> to the <Hi>. cafe. <laughs> see you in there. Oh, Malensu is here. Hi, Malensu. <laughs> Rich, thank you so much for your comment. It was, thank you so much. And sister, please uh, let us know if you need help getting a junto up or anything. Um, I would love, love to be there, and I hope. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm planning on it, <laughs> no matter when it's scheduled. But <laughs> let's see the time. Would love. I will. I reach out to you, Vivek, because I will need help organizing something like that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll be thank you. we'll be here. We'll be here. That's perfect. perfect. Okay. We'll see you all if you're joining in the cafe. <laughs> I think we got a Kung Fu Junto. Let's see. In the end will be perfect. <laughs> Let's do it. Um it's um one of the Malaysian mentor. Uh yeah. So he says Is five PM Pacific. Yeah. She can, yeah. 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 Amazing. So, if you put it on the count, yeah, I'll see if I can hit 5 p.m. Pacific. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> that sounds fun. That sounds fun. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to close okay. this, but uh, Thank you. see you all in gather. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.